Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, this is a topic that I'm excited to get into and talk some more about sustainable exhibit practices. So first, I just wanted to start off by introducing the Image Permanence Institute, which is um, the, the organization that is bringing this webinar to you all today. Um, we are a nonprofit research laboratory based out of the Rochester Institute of Technology, and we provide um, research uh, services, products, and tools to support the preservation of cultural heritage collections around the world. Um, my name is Kelly Krish. I'm the preventive conservation specialist here, and I work on the environmental consulting team to help institutions improve their preservation as well as their sustainability. So um, I would also encourage you to check out our other resources on our website. We have a number of free webinars, including ones on energy monitoring and quick tips for implementing sustainable practices, as well as other resources, a free guidebook on how to implement energy saving strategies for mechanical systems, as well as numerous others. So if, um, if those sound of interest to you, please do check out our website for further resources. So we'll just start off by kind of talking about what are sustainable exhibit practices. Really, when we talk about um, green exhibits, we can either be talking about exhibits on topics about sustainability or um, exhibits that are designed in such a way that uh, they themselves are sustainable. And that really has to do with many facets of the exhibit, as we'll see, everything from the packaging and transport of any loan objects to the exhibit space, the choice of materials and design and fabrication of the exhibit spaces themselves, as well as how we operate the spaces in the temperature and relative humidity set points and the lighting controls. And each of these represent an opportunity for us to also contribute to the preservation of our objects by um, you know, having materials that are um, safe to use with the objects and reduce off gassing, um, you know, lower lighting levels and safe set points um, for environmental conditions. So we'll get into more of that. Um, I'll, I'll let our speakers handle that. But I did just want to touch base. Um, thank you, everyone, for the answers to the registration questions. And I just kind of wanted to take a quick opportunity to share out some of the answers especially this first one um, in terms of the sustainable practices that are currently in use. Um, a number of people did say that they weren't sure or there were none. So hopefully this is a good opportunity to get some ideas and start those discussions. Um, obviously lighting was, was a very popular one as was the reuse of materials, which included everything from walls, exhibit cases and packing materials um, as well as mounts. Um, this is great. Uh, there was a, a large use of recycling as well, but obviously reuse would, would be preferred to that. And um, let's see, we talked, there was a number of shipping and transport. So people talked about using in house exhibits, the use of virtual couriers or consolidating shipments. In terms of environmental, um, the selection of parameters, the use of microclimates and energy efficient systems or passive controls. And then for material selection, uh, that included the use of recycled or recyclable products, um, green products, and local suppliers. And um, to a lesser degree, people did talk about keeping exhibits up for longer or being able to maintain the floor plans, um, as well as the use of teams and integrating sustainable decision making into the process. In terms of the biggest hurdles, um, cost, real or perceived, was by far the lar by far the largest. But um, there was also some uh, recognized limitations in terms of the staff and time that it takes to research and implement the strategies um, for, for more green exhibit practices. Uh, a large concern about tradition and buy-in, changing mentality can be difficult, as well as getting buy-in from management. Um, when it's seen as not a priority for the institution. Um, there's a strong sense of the value of new or customizable for uh, what we see, especially for exhibits, um, as well as a concern in terms of the availability of materials that meet criteria, whether that be preservation or other aesthetics. I thought one of the uh, really interesting ones that also kind of 
hit the nail on the head was um, someone mentioned convenience. Uh, so I think that is a hurdle, um, you know, in terms of getting those materials and having the procedures in place and the understanding um, uh, across the board to be able to implement the strategies without those additional uh, costs and staff time. In terms of the biggest opportunities as a field, um, we are, have a heavy emphasis on material selection and reuse uh, combined with waste management. Also an interest in reducing transportation and staying local, um, focusing more on using our own collections. And then to a lesser degree, um, having new practices and mindsets where we do emphasize less turnover of exhibits and simplified builds through changes in design and fabrication practices. So um, the, these slides will be available for you to, to look through as well. So if you didn't catch all of that right now, no worries. Um, but I'm going to um, stop sharing right now and turn it over to our first speaker. So Alice, if you are ready, um, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Let me just share my screen with you all. Here we go. Great. Well, thank you very much, Kelly, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. My name is Alice Bono. I'm an independent art curator, writer, and speaker working at the intersection of art and ecology. And I'm also a sustainability consultant and the founding director of Villa Villa, a sustainable and climate conscious arts program. So today in the 15 minutes or so that I have, I'm going to present a shorter version of the course Curating an Ecologically Sensitive Exhibition that I'm teaching. So we're going to be looking at ways to reduce the carbon footprint of temporary exhibitions of contemporary art. Um, this is, you'll see the result of my uh, research and experience in curating um, exhibitions with a strong environmental awareness, a strong environmental impact awareness. And um, so that you know what we'll be talking about, um, I'll start by introdu introducing the methodology that I use. Um, just a few words about the context. About three years ago, I started to completely reconsider my practice as an independent curator. And I spent a few months researching about ways to be more environmentally friendly. And back then, three years ago, um, it was pre-COVID uh, and it was also a time um, when we didn't have access to as much resources as we do today um, because it seemed that the sector wasn't, um, there wasn't such a significant interest in the arts industry um, for greener practices. So at that time, um, I had to come up with my own methodology, which I'll present to you in the next slide. Um, and I hope it will inspire other curators to also ask themselves those questions. Um, I will also go through some of the exhibition making steps um, and their associated carbon footprint. And because we don't have time to go through each of them quite thoroughly, I'll focus on just uh, three um, exhibition making steps those that um, create the most CO2 emissions. So when using an environmental approach to um, curating from the start, the aims that I had was to understand first the environmental issues related to exhibition curated in order to be able to measure the direct and indirect impacts that this practice can have on the environment um, in order to then identify the levels that I could use as a curator to reduce the carbon footprint of each of the steps. So I started by making a list of the steps needed to set up an exhibition. I then identified those that have a negative impact on the environment, because we'll see that not all of them have a similar impact. Then I classified them according to their level of CO2 emissions, thinking that I should probably um, tackle those that uh, emit the most CO2 pollution uh, emissions first uh, as a priority. And then I asked myself, okay, so I can, I reduce those emissions. Is there any more sustainable options, um, greener alternatives available? And can I afford them? So with that in mind, I then applied this technique to all the exhibition steps, which again applies to my 
um, position as an independent curator. Um, they might slightly vary depending on if curators work full time for an organization and have other um, colleagues that they can work for different steps of those, but more or less we'll see that um, even if the order change, um, curating and organizing an exhibition involves at some point um, all of those stages. But as I said, um, they do not create uh, CO2 emissions to the same levels and research has shown that the three steps that um, do pollute the most or for a museum um, transport, then the building, the physical um, in infrastructure, and then comes the production of the exhibition. So those are the three points that I will focus on right now, starting by the production. And I'm trying to be quite fast. I hope you can hear me well, but I've got many things that I'd like to cover today. So by production, I actually include this first step um, that is the concept of the exhibition. So as curator, we start to ask ourselves, what will the exhibition be about? Which artists will be exhibited? Uh, where will the show take place? And for how long? And I now with experience um, insist on the fact that even if this is the right beginning of this exhibition uh, making process, the questions that we do ask ourselves right from the beginning will have an impact on the overall carbon footprint of the exhibition. So it's important to be forward thinking and to really anticipate um, those decisions because later on in the process, we might not have time or financial resources to choose for the greener options. So it's good to, to know that right from the beginning. Um, as we saw in the result of the, the pool that was sent, um, yes, one way of uh, reducing the overall carbon footprint of an exhibition for an exhibition venue is to increase the duration of exhibitions um, and or to reduce the number of exhibitions, um, say in a yearly programming. And it's true that in the art, contemporary art world and uh, galleries, it's not uncommon to have uh, exhibition venues that have many um, short exhibitions throughout the year. So one very easy way to reduce the carbon footprint of that um, organization is to uh, reduce the number of them and to increase their duration. One thing that I also like to um, stress is the difference, as Kelly mentioned at the beginning of the presentation as well, the difference between an exhibition that addresses the climate crisis or other environmental issues, which is not automatically an environmentally sustainable exhibition and vice versa. So an environmentally sustainable exhibition, which consciously consider the impact the exhibition will have on the environment, doesn't necessarily have to um, address environmental issues or um, ecological issues as well. Other artistic decisions um, right at this stage might include um, working with fewer artists and artwork and presenting less artworks, because we know that the more artists and artworks, the higher the carbon footprint. Um, what I do and encourage other curators to do as well is to consider the distance between the artist and the gallery or the other exhibition venue, um, and therefore to prefer to include local artists or artists for whom green shipping options are available, because we know that the further away the artists and their works are from the exhibition venue, the greater the pollution from transportation and, and travels. We'll see that in a minute. Um, other ways could be to prefer low maintenance exhibitions and to recycle or to revive previous exhibitions which is also linked to um, what I'm about to say about artworks. So after um, deciding uh, which artists we want to work with, then the question of which artworks we're going to include in the show comes. And similar to what I just said about reviving previous exhibitions, I know that today it's all about um, showing new contents, so always the new um, content that have been produced, but I think it's time to also create value around um, re-showing and re-exhibiting already existing artworks, or at least creating a balance between the two. So what I try to do with my own exhibitions is to have this good balance between including artworks that already exist and then commissioning new artworks so that it also um, naturally reduces the carbon footprint of the artworks produced. Um, although 
once I've selected and invited the artists to participate in the exhibition, um, it is no longer my job to um, share my, how, how to put it, um, concerns about the work. Um, by that, I mean that it's the artist you have, you know, full carte blanche to produce the work. Um, I tend to try at the beginning to ask them how they produce their work, um, because we know that there's also differences in the toxicity of some products that they use, um, or some different uh, levels of waste involved as well, um, depending on the practice of the artist, the materials and the processes that they use. So one thing that can be done as well is to add in the artist contracts a close about their commitment to green working standards. Um, that is a, a way um, I found to encourage them to ask themselves those questions from the beginning. So I've also included here a few different ways for artists to have a sustainable practice, which has um, obviously an impact on the exhibition itself. Um, so if you want to reduce the overall impact of the exhibition, working with artists that are uh, ecologically sensitive will help. Uh, if you're interested, because I don't have time to go too much into details into this, um, I've written a survey report, which I'll put in the chat, the link, with Villa Villa um, on environmentally sustainable artists to your practices. And um, I invite everyone to have a look if you're interested in finding ways to help artists be more sustainable. So that covers uh, more aspects from the maintenance of the studio, the material use, the waste, uh, and so on. So I continue. Um, after um, choosing what the exhibition will be about, what will be the concept and the theme of the exhibition, who artists are going to be presented, um, where is the exhibition going to be, is the next step. So this, I believe, is going to be um, some of it covered by Al just after me. Um, so I won't spend too much time on this, but there's many ways for exhibition venues to be more environmentally friendly and personally. So that again applies to me as an independent curator since I each time uh, I'm working with new institutions or um, galleries. I aim to collaborate with those that comply with environmental policies or that are in the process of doing so. Of course, if today we have um, full-time curators working for institutions, museums, um, and other cultural uh, places, they might not have the options to choose who they want to work with, but they can influence their organizations to be more sustainable. And um, there'll be many things to, to say about this, but I'll carry on. Um, here as well, because I'm, I'm just conscious of time, um, I won't go into too many detail, but we have many different ways um, in the production period to choose green options and alternatives. So vinyl littering, for instance, which is a, a very essential uh, material when organizing an exhibition doesn't necessarily have to be from plastic. There's other options. Same thing when it comes to printing exhibition materials, catalogs or brochures. Um, there's online um, bunch of resources explaining how you can achieve to do it in a more sustainable way. Um, then when you have the content of the exhibition produced, the artworks ready to be um, shown comes the moment when you have to travel and transport the works. So here I've included um, a little graph just to introduce some of the ideas I'm going to be presenting in this section. So you can see that, um, as we would expect, the modes of transport that uh, create the most CO2 emissions or um, air flights, and um, of course, domestic ones um, do pollute a lot more than long distance ones. What's interest interesting to see as well is that um, depending on the number of passengers in one of those modes of transport, um, the CO2 emissions vary because it's calculated on um, the number of in, in, um, passengers in it. So there is a difference indeed between a car being used by only one passenger and um, one being used by four. 
So this is something that it can be kept in mind when deciding which modes of transport to use, um, preferring a plane or a car or a train or any modes of transport that are full um, is always less polluting than when it's almost empty. So with this in mind, what I really try to um, implement for myself as a curator, but also encourage others to do, is to uh, follow those three steps when it comes to uh, reducing the CO2 emissions from air travel, to refuse, reduce, or offset. So best way to reduce the CO2 emission, of course, is to refuse um, and avoid air travel, prefer another mode of transport. Um, now we're all very familiar with uh, video conferencing um, instead of in-person meetings, discussions, interviews. Same thing like today for conferences, um, even when they do still happen um, ERL, um, many speakers ask if they can send a video instead of coming and that reduces um, the, the air travels. If um, that also happens, um, there's really no other option than, than, than flying for long distance trips. Um, as I explained, there's different ways to uh, choose the best option, the, the more eco-friendly one. Um, online exists a few different comparison between air uh, companies. Some of them have in place rules um, that implies better environmental standards. And um, I think something that is quite important if one decides to use flight um, indeed to travel is to make sure that we commit to using the trip wisely. So combining it for other uh, business or leisure reasons, um, going for a longer period of time than just on a weekend or examples of ways that you can implement um, to be more mindful of or impact on the planet. And then of course, um, offsetting. Um, but offsetting, I'd say, is and should be the last option. So if one has already refused and reduced and there's no other option than um, air traveling, then um, offsetting can be um, a way to reduce the carbon footprint. So I've got just a few more slides um, still in the transport section. So in terms of short distances, and for this, I'm including both um, the public uh, attending an exhibition. And we know that for the Louvre, for instance, in Paris, 99% of their CO2 emission comes from the travel of the public, of the audience. Now, of course, um, one might say that this is a bit biased because the public going to the Louvre is not going coming from around the world just to see the Louvre. It's something they do uh, part of their trip, but still it gives us an idea of the um, significant um, amount uh, that the travel um, takes within a museum. So things that I try to put in place and encourage others to do is to adapt the exhibition and other events timetable to the local public transport timetable, making sure that um, after an event happens in the evening, uh, it's not ending just a few minutes after the last uh, train, bus, or um, other ways of transport. Um, making sure if you encourage employees or um, the public to cycle to your venue while providing them with a storage space um, is always something that helps. Joining cycle to work initiatives, encouraging shared transport, and so on. And so just to finish, I'm going to give you an example of um, what I consider one of the best future clean ways of transport. So for transporting artworks and shipping them from either the artist studio or the gallery or the storage place, or if it's um, lend, loan, uh, lending a work from a collector or an institution, um, always preferring uh, rail, road or sea freight. You can also make sure um, that working with um, partners that do things sustainably, sustainably um, is preferred. And so as an example, uh, here quickly we can see um, the difference actually um, between air and sea freight. So in terms of time, you do see that using sea freight takes longer. So what I was talking about um, at first about this forward thinking, forward planning, 
is very important because of course at the last minute, if you have to send some work, you have to consider that it's gonna take longer, but um, also this idea of slow curation and being able to do things not in a rush, but really take your time and work on quality over quantity um, will help you to overcome this. And then we already know it, the cost is lower um, when, you, when you use the sea freight options and so is the CO2 emission as well. And so what I'm working on at the moment is an exhibition titled Chasseurs de Tempêtes, Storm Hunters, um, for which I've invited two French artists and two Portuguese artists because it's part of the cross-cultural season between France and Portugal, organized by the French Institute for 2022. And so the exhibition is going to take place in two uh, contemporary art centers, one in Brest in France um, and one in Madeira uh, on the Portuguese island. And the exhibition addresses environmental issues in coastal regions and on the marine uh, uh, habitats. And therefore, the idea I had was to use a sailboat, the one that we see here, the Gallant, to transport the artworks. So I've been working on um, for about two years now, dealing with insurers, dealing with artists, dealing with the company which is not specialized in art uh, handling but making sure that we can try these new ways of, of transporting our works that are safe. Um, and of course, working with artists on selecting works that um, will not be damaged from um, the ambience of the water and the salt. So um, I think that's it for now because I'm almost over time. Um, I know that Al is going to talk about packaging as well. So I will stop it there. Thank you for listening. Hi, uh, my name is Al Carver Kubik and I am a researcher here at Image Permanence Institute. Um, and so I will be sharing some of my recent research we are about a year and a half into the project. So what I'll be doing is giving you some of our preliminary results as well as just the idea of the project. So it's fairly common, at least in the United States, for paper-based objects to be housed in individual microenvironments called sealed frame packages in order to maintain a constant moisture content uh, and mechanical stability during transit. The objects are then shipped in museum shipping crates, which also incidentally create a microenvironment. And so our research is, is on this topic, specifically looking at paper-based objects um, and how the microenvironments perform both in the sealed frame packages as well as in the museum shipping crates. Um, the sealed frame package and crate material packing materials are largely petrochemical plastics, some of which can be reused, uh, but certainly not indefinitely. So eventually the materials end up at the landfill. The goals of the project are to determine when sealed frame packages are needed for transit and display, what sealed frame package and crate construction and crate packing materials provide good microenvironments to buffer against changes in relative humidity, and what crate packing materials buffer against changes in temperature. Um, we are exploring materials currently used in the field as well as more environmentally sustainable materials. Uh, we're doing both field and laboratory research components, uh, which will provide us with information that's necessary to create data-driven data guidelines for museums to make research-based, informed, sustainable, and cost-efficient decisions for maintaining preservation standards when traveling and displaying paper, framed paper-based collection objects. So the beginning of our sealed frame package study began with a questionnaire that we sent out to the professionals in the field in order to gather information on commonly used materials. Um, so this includes the type of glazing, the backing board material, vapor-proof barrier material, and the seal. Um, and from the questionnaire data, we selected materials and purchased them and, and formed our experimental design. So here we have um, 
we have a cross section or schematic of, of all of the elements of a sealed frame package. And this is just some of the data from that uh, questionnaire that we sent out. So when we created our experimental design, we decided to evaluate each material independently. So for example, in testing the moisture buffering capacity of vapor-proof barrier materials, every package has glass glazing, a matte package, corrugated paperboard backing or blue board, and metal foil tape as the seal. And it was only that vapor barrier that varied. We put an electronic um, temperature and humidity data logger in the center of each package. So here uh, is a picture of our director, Jay, who's, who's also a trained conservator, creating one of the sealed frame packages. The data logger is then nestled in the mat board, sort of in the center, in a little cavity. Here you can see the backing with the, with the vapor proof barrier here. And then they were put into our temperature and humidity controlled chambers. Um, so here's the experimental profile that we used. Uh, there's two, two parts of the experimental profile. The first part was, was looking only at temperature and the second part was really looking at RH. And so the first part of the profile began with a series of temperature changes starting at 20 degrees Celsius, going up to 30, down to 10, and then back to 20 degrees Celsius, all at a constant relative humidity of 40%. And the purpose of this is to understand how the hygroscopic or moisture containing material Impacted, impacted the internal relative humidity of the package. Um, with an increase in temperature, the materials were expected to release moisture, causing the internal relative humidity to increase. And the opposite was expected with the decrease in temperature in which the materials would absorb moisture and the internal relative humidity would decrease. And so um, on the right here, you can see that's really exactly what happened is um, the blue line is the measured relative humidity inside the package. And so with this increase in temperature to 30 Celsius, we had a slight increase in relative humidity in the package. And then down to 10 degrees Celsius, we had a slight decrease in relative humidity. Um, it turns out, and, and if, if you can see um, the zero, is that starting point of 20 degrees Celsius, 40% relative humidity. So what we're really seeing is the change in relative humidity, the gain and loss. And it's only three to 4%, which is really not concerning. Uh, in reviewing the literature, what I found is that uh, there's an equation that um, could predict temperature-driven changes in relative humidity. And so while the context for the equation was actually looking at museum shipping crates, it really can apply to any microenvironment in which there's a small air volume and a fair amount of hygroscopic material, such as a sealed frame package. And so here, the um, orange line shows us the calculated, based on this equation up here, what you would expect the change in relative humidity to be. And you can see it's really very close. So the second part of the experimental profile looked at moisture equilibration rates or how long it will take for the moisture outside the package to make its way inside the package. We increased the temperature to 25 Celsius, increased the relative humidity to 70% and held that for 12 weeks. So this is just the pre preliminary data again on vapor-proof barriers. Uh, at the end of 12 weeks, the Marvel seal reached 10% moisture equilibration. In other words, it increased sort of 10% in the difference between the 40% and 70% relative humidity. Um, and incidentally, aluminum foil, just plain aluminum foil that you buy at the grocery store, did really well uh, too, reaching about 30% moisture equi equilibration. And the reason why I point that out is that's a material that isn't, com that isn't being used in the field. Um, but when we look at Marvel Seal, it's a plastic and aluminum laminate material. And the aluminum foil layer in the Marvel Seal is doing a lot of the work in, as a vapor-proof barrier. And so I really wanted to look at aluminum foil and it performed quite well. Um, and also this is sort of a worst case scenario. It's unlikely that, that your, your objects will sit at a high relative humidity, such as 70% for 12 weeks. So just like the sealed frame packages, uh, in, in looking at crate construction and, and packing materials, we sent out a questionnaire. We're just in the beginning phases of testing this, these materials. And so what we're interested in is how the crates, the, how the crate itself performs as a microenvironment, 
as well as various packing materials and configurations. So um, that data will be done in another year or so. We are doing field experiments, however, as well. And so our field partners are placing one temperature and relative humidity data logger in the upper tray or outer slip case of a crate containing paper-based objects. And they're also putting one on the outside, allowing us to compare the internal and external conditions. So these images, we have our data logger, which we put in a nice little package that, that nestles into the, into the packing material of the crate inside. And then here's the one on the outside of the crate. On the right, we have an example from one of our partners. Uh, the crate, it was a half inch plywood with a sealant applied to the exterior. The lid had a gasket and it was packed with half inch ethafoam uh, wrapped in marble seal. The crate was shipped in a temperature and humidity controlled truck. Uh, the internal and external temperatures, as we can see, are about the same. And so the red line is the external temperature and the blue green and orange lines are the internal temperature. So we can see they're all the same and they're all at a very steady sort of 20 degrees Celsius or 68 Fahrenheit. The external relative humidity, which is this light red line, um, was higher than what was reported by the truck vendor. Uh, it was supposed to be in, in sort of the 50% plus or minus range, um, I think plus or minus 5% but it ended up being more between 58 and 65% relative humidity. However, what we can see is that the crate buffered against this higher relative humidity, maintaining a relatively constant RH or relative humidity of around 50%. So the return trip of the same loan, we can see that the um, external relative humidity and internal relative humidity um, we're pretty close. The, again, the red line is the external, and it is within the range that the truck vendor had reported, um, and our internal relative humidity is stable, as is the temperature. So in this scenario, the institution did not use the thermal insulator, and there really was no need for one. So while the external relative humidity was higher than expected outgoing in the outgoing phase, um, the plywood and ethafoam provided a stable microenvironment for the objects. Here's an example in which crates traveled by air. They flew west coast, to east coast of the United States, and then flew to Europe. To Europe. Uh, and this is a segment of the return trip in which uh, the crates appear to have sat on an airport tarmac in an enclosed space, like a cargo hold or um, a loading bay or of some sort. And the external temperatures reached a high of 50 Celsius or 122 Fahrenheit for about a four hour period. Um, however, um, this crate did have a thermal insulating layer, and um, it, it really mitigated that change or that high temperature. It, it buffered against that high temperature, which is, which is really great. It only, it only raised um, by about six degrees inside the crate. We also saw a slight increase in relative humidity due to this temperature change. Um, it was only about 3%, which is not particularly concerning. I don't know if this loan had a courier or not. Um, I believe it probably didn't. And not having a courier is really great for sustainability, as Alice had pointed out, um, saving both money and carbon emissions. But it's unlikely that the crates would have sat on the tarmac, tarmac for this extended period of time if, if there had been a courier. Um, and so there are you know, other options for being more sustainable. Um, but I won't go through those because I, I feel like Alice really covered that. Uh, while the thermal insulator in this crate worked really, really well, um, super glad they used it, uh, it, it was polystyrene. Um, and so in the lab, we'll be testing thermal insulators that are being used, such as polystyrene, but also more environmentally friendly options to give lenders um, more choices. Uh, yeah, um, and just kind of as a side note, the state of New York has banned polystyrene uh, for, for food containers, it's styrofoam basically, because it's so bad for the environment. Okay, so continuing with microenvironments for, for display, so we can consider to create a microenvironment for transit. Um, the sealed frame package is a microenvironment that's useful for the transit as well as display. 
Um, and then there's also sort of for three dimensional objects, you can you can have a case. And so creating microenvironments for select objects sensitive to changes in moisture content and ones that are risk for mechanical deformation allows institutions to exhibit objects that otherwise may not necessarily be safe to exhibit. This may also allow institutions to relax their relative humidity settings in the gallery space to allow for more seasonal fluctuations, which in turn leads to money saving um, and savings in carbon emissions. Um, so just as a side note, any collection object that um, is going to off gas, uh, any, any kind of um, um, chemical that will accelerate deterioration really shouldn't be put in a microenvironment. For example, poorly processed photographs, you know, if they smell, um, not, not good for a microenvironment. Um, there's two approaches to creating a microenvironment um, case. There's a sort of mechanical approach and a passive approach. This is an example of a mechanical approach in which the case was fitted with a dedicated mechanical system to control the relative humidity for artifacts that require a tighter relative humidity control than the rest of the gallery. And they did this in lieu of controlling the entire gallery to human comfort conditions of 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 55% relative humidity. With this approach, the institution saved $13,420 a year and had energy savings of 60,573 kilowatts per year compared to what it would have taken to condition the entire gallery. The other option is a passive approach. And a passive approach um, microenvironment should have a good vapor barrier and a good seal. And it may or may not need uh, additional hygroscopic or absorbent material like silica gel. Um, other considerations are to put a data logger inside the microenvironment to monitor it. Um, all of the material should be inert and the lighting should be distanced from the case to avoid any heat buildup. Here's an example of internal and external relative humidity data from display case that had acrylic lid uh, as a vapor barrier and did not have any additional absorbance or anything like that. Um, the green line is the internal case relative humidity and the orange is the external relative humidity in the gallery. So we can see that it actually provided a really good microenvironment with just a very simple design. The last word here will be on light. Um, light is a preservation risk. It can fade colorants. It can cause paper, cloth, and other organic materials to break down. And so we want to minimize our light exposure. Um, and by doing so, we can also save energy. We can use light bulbs in existing fixtures that are more energy efficient and emit less in harmful wavelengths like ultraviolet. Uh, LED bulbs are a really good example. We also pay twice for our lights. So um, our lights provide a heat load. And so our mechanical system, our HVAC system, in order to maintain the, uh, the temperature in the gallery, have to remove that heat load as well. So we have extra energy and extra money spent to remove the heat load as well as to run the lights. It may be more cost effective to replace the light fixtures altogether. And um, if the replacement cost of new bulbs is high, or if your bulbs aren't, you have a system where you can't, can't simply switch out the bulbs. Instead of having sort of one master switch, which controls all the lights or most of the lights in the space, you can install sub switches in order to adjust lighting and less use spaces. Uh, this may be more practical for your staff spaces than your gallery spaces. Um, another idea is motion sensors. This is particularly useful, again, in staff work areas where lights may be left on all day, even if that area isn't occupied. But this can also be, uses, be useful in gallery spaces that have low traffic or, uh, or you know, have days and periods where there's lower traffic. Uh, a lot of institutions use timers. Timers are used uh, to schedule when lights automatically turn on and off. Uh, and and um, sometimes they sort of come off of schedule. And so you just need to make sure that they're adjusted and ensure that they're running on schedule. Sometimes they've just simply stopped operating. So it's good to check for that too. Um, so, you know, if they're not working properly, that can result in the lights being on um, more than what you think they are, more than anticipated. Another idea is just to reduce the number of lights and intensity of lights in a space. So reducing the number of lights in a gallery space may not be possible, um, but it might be possible in a staff workspace. 
sometimes offices just have way more lights than are really needed or really wanted. And so you can remove the bulbs altogether, or you can just turn off some of the lights if you do have sub switches. In a gallery space, objects benefit from low level lights uh, to reduce any kind of induced light damage. 50 lux is sort of the minimum light level needed to properly see. With that said, our ability to see in low light diminishes with age, but just simply lowering light levels is another way to save energy as well as to protect our more vulnerable objects. And that, that is all. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Alice and Al. Um, I'm now going to play um, Brenda recorded her presentation. I think we are going to be running up pretty close to the um, 11 o'clock Eastern time. So we will stick around for Q&A afterwards. But if you need to, to leave, um, we'll try to, to make these resources available to you as well. So let's see. Hello, my name is Brenda Baker. I'm the Vice President of Exhibits, Facilities, and Strategic Initiatives at Madison Children's Museum. Our museum is located in Madison, Wisconsin, in the Midwest part of the United States, about two and a half hours north of Chicago. This is a bird's eye view of our 26,000 square foot building in the heart of downtown Madison. You can see we've got solar panels and a rooftop garden on the top. We serve about, about 200,000 visitors per year uh, that's pre-COVID numbers, and we're located in a progressive university town situated in the middle of Five Lakes. Today, I'm going to give you an overview of our sustainable exhibit design practices. First, I'll show you some of the history of our practices and how they began, as well as the resources for the museum field that we've developed to support other people's work. And finally, I'm going to take you on a tour of one of our most recent exhibit projects, the Trash Lab, which is a culmination of all we've learned about sustainable exhibit design over the past two and a half decades. I love this hand scrawled note and the way it sums up why the work we do really matters. At the end of the day, our work is really to inspire those who enter our doors to care for others, other people, other species, other belief systems, other histories, all while enriching and protecting our shared futures for the well being of all. Seeing the world as interconnected and imbuing that reverence for life for all living creatures as equally important as our own lives is the very bedrock of all of our sustainability work. In the early 1990s, we were not thinking about creating green exhibits or sustainable exhibits at all, but instead, like most children's museums, we were trying to think about how to best meet the needs of children, uh, their social, physical, intellectual, and emotional developmental needs. But when we started unearthing all of the toxins in our everyday exhibit making materials and the materials commonly used in creating interior spaces, we were horrified kind of at what we found. We were inadvertently poisoning our young children when they crawled on the carpet in our exhibits or put plastic toys in their mouths or inhaled fumes from the chemicals off gassing in the laminates we used. We learned that children's immune systems are not fully developed until age five and by the nature of the way the kids grow, they're close to the ground crawling around when, where the toxins settle in. They put things in their mouths. Um, and so we decided to start experimenting to see if we could find a new way. Um, what we've learned since then, of course, is that um, design comes with responsibility and that design really is a signal of human intention. The way we design uh, matters to the world. And if we design responsibly, that shows that we care. Um, like William McDonough quoted in the, the earlier slide I showed, love all children of all species for all time. If we really care about the children we serve and their futures, we would stop using the materials that are harmful to them and every species on our planet. Unfortunately, in the United States, green chemistry is a fledgling field of study, so it's really up to the consumer to figure out if, they are using, if what they're using is, is toxic, which is not the case in other parts of the world. Just because something is available does not mean it is safe for human health. I propose that we look at design as a signal of human intention and base all design and fabrication decisions on the well-being of children and their, their health and safety. 
We started our work uh, with the, the first green exhibit that we made, and as far as we know, it was the first green exhibit in U.S. children's museums in the country in 1998. The exhibit was called First Feats, and we set out to not use any plastics, no laminates, um, and to use 90 95% natural, sustainable, and local materials. Um, we, we chose, we used no VOC paints, uh, limited, we tried to limit our known toxins, and we designed, designed and built locally using local resources and local artists. Um, th that exhibit was very, very successful. Um, and then one of the most important decisions we made after that in 2004 was to create a sustainability um, institutional mission statement that guides all of our work. And this has been really, really critical. If you, ha if you don't have something like this, I'd highly recommend it. Um, this has been has kept our institution holding on to the long view of what's important um, through board and staff leadership changes and has provided really clarity for all of our decision making. Next, we started uh, a website called greenexhibits.org, and this this opened up in 20, um, 2006, and the idea was to share all that we had learned about creating green exhibits with others. So this is, if you look at the button here on the right, you can see the overview of what the sections of the um, website include. Um, it's how do you rethink if you're just getting started, how do you plan, how do you build, uh, and that one includes lots of resources in terms of materials. Um, then we have a connect section that's got uh, readings and other websites we found useful. And finally, case studies. And I just want to put in a caveat that this um, has not been updated since the beginning of COVID. Um, so there's some work to do this year on that. Um, but one of the things that we do have in here is a sustainable exhibit design checklist that we created. And while this is what you see on the left is really um, just a, a, an abbreviation of what's found on that, this is something we use um, every time we're making an exhibit to make sure that um, we're following um, the best practices. In 2010, we, we were able to expand the scope of our work um, when we opened our new facility. And we, we started with a, we launched an only lo local initiative, basically with the idea that we would only use local materials, local people, and local resources to, you know, complete our entire building. Um, we challenged ourselves to, uh, to do this in order to cut down on shipping, consultant travel, and the end result was that it really spurred deeper connections within our local community. We were able to work with over 15,000 citizens in the renovation. Um, that included children making artwork for the bathrooms. That included donors, uh, people donating their hair dryers for seating. Um, anyway, it, it, it sparked a, a really wonderful um, revolution in creative thinking for our museum that is very much a part of our institution's culture today. And then we be, inside the museum, we began experimenting with different sustainability goals for each exhibit. This exhibit called um, The Wilderness, uh, our goal was to use only local, natural, and sustainable materials sourced from within 500 miles of Madison. Um, so the floor is all made out of, uh, of ash that was, you know, we had the emerald ash borer um, infecting all of the ash trees in Wisconsin. So these were sustainably harvested. Um, then you see straw clay. Um, some cedar, and then some stone that was all locally sourced. We experimented with uh, reclaimed materials in the exhibit called Possibilopolis. In this image, you see an old airplane that we made into a tinkering table. Um, you see the floor, reclaimed, a reclaimed gym floor. Um, we had some fire hose boxes behind the tinkering table where we stored materials. And then you can even see the tiny little bread pans we used for um, for boxes to sort materials on the table. We also began experimenting um, with, with sustainable solutions as part of the content. Um, this, um, the hodgepodge Mahal climber is on the left hand, there's a left hand image. And again, this was using reclaimed materials, including a buoy, some farm cisterns, uh, uh, there's a car in there, and then also reclaimed slide parts. Um, where the image on the right is on our rooftop, and this one is a, our solar sunflower exhibit, which allows children to experiment with the sun's energy. Um, and as they move the pieces, uh, 
covering the solar panels to the left or to the right. Um, if it's a sunny day, they can make the panel, uh, they can make the sunflowers, the flowers move um, by exposing more sun, and then they can make them stop moving and stop growing uh, when they cover them. And lastly, I'm going to show you the trash lab exhibit. This is one of the two exhibits that we completed during the pandemic. This ex exhibit um, kind of pulled together all of the things I showed you in the previous slides, the reclaimed materials, the natural materials, working locally, all of those things. Um, and we also included solar energy with this as well. Um, this was a partnership with the Dane County Department of Waste and Renewables. And the idea, the goal was to, um, to help people understand the story of waste, um, how to rethink waste, how to protect the environment, and how to think about redesigning the systems that lead to waste and lead to, you know, to landfills that are overflowing. Uh, this one, in this exhibit, unlike some of the others, the content matches the materials where um, it's about trash and it was made with 90% trash. 90% of the materials came from the Dane County landfill. We had an uh, access, diversity, and inclusion goal of using this um, trailer to get out to um, populations that couldn't otherwise come to the landfill or the museum to see the exhibit. Um, overall sustainability goals for this project, aside from using 90% reclaimed materials, was to show the social, environmental, and economic inequities of waste and encourage a shift in mindset. So this picture, of course, has a lot of emotional resonance when you, when you imagine your own children playing in such a horrible uh, mess. Um, so again, 90% of those materials came from the waste stream. Um, the idea was to have a call for action and an idea to encourage people to, to, to buy less and waste less. So we're really trying to use, think about what tools we can use to nudge people to action. Um, let's see, we demonstrated how the landfills um, would work to protect the environment. We explored the social, economic, and environmental impacts of waste worldwide and are encouraging creative thinking about solutions. So there's three sections of this exhibit, um, rethink, protect, and design. And ultimately, the goal is to get people to understand that landfills really are not a great solution. They're a Band-Aid solution only. And what we really need to do is get people thinking in a more of a circular system, like a biological system, um, where there is no such thing as waste. You can see in this um, image that we've got, um, we're making use of, um, of reclaimed materials. There's metal and a variety of different kinds of, of um, wood. Uh, the panels that you see uh, are printed with uh, water-based inks, and those are the only, that's the only new material we used in the exhibit was, um, was those panels for printing, because that's, that's often the hardest thing for people in green exhibits is thinking about printing, and we found that printing on wood and using um, water-soluble inks has been a great solution. This is just a, a case that, that um, a cabinet of curiosity that highlights uh, some of the things we found in the waste stream. And this is a sort of an I spy game for kids. The protect section really is trying to get kids to understand how landfills work to protect the air, water, land, and communities that we live in. Uh, and basically understanding the science behind it. Um, this is a, the, this is a, a model of the, the landfill in our county. Um, and it shows how they work. Um, shows new innovations in waste management and the complex path of leachate, water, and natural gases. There's also an area here that shows the decomposition rates of something in a landfill, the difference between a banana peel and a plastic bag, for example. Um, and we're also trying to emphasize that there are positive ways to use retired landfills. The protect section also shows how our landfill in our county is um, producing renewable natural gas or RNG at the RNG plant here, where the where the um, gases um, from the landfill are actually going are being converted into um, fuel that can power the vehicles um, that our county uses for buses and trucks and all of the transportation um, needs of our community. 
The redesign section is the most fun because it gets kids really thinking about how they can think differently and how they can take action. Um, so instead of the standard three R's, we, we've, we've added refuse and redesign. And each one of these has an activity um, corresponding with it. In the reduce section, there's a, uh, a, calc a calculator where you can um, calculate your single-use plastic in your that you use in a lifetime and figure out how to make a commitment to re reducing that. Um, in the reuse section, we're encouraging kids to come up with creative solutions through a mashup of objects, um, come up with a new hybrid um, object. Recycling, they're, they're um, look, sorting through innovative products to identify the original recycled materials. The refuse section is basically a selfie station where people are making a commitment um, to be part of the solution, not part of the problem, by refusing to, um, oopsie, by refusing to um, participate in lots of consumerism. Um, the redesign section, um, the, well, actually this is reuse, the redesign section, um, this is this is the, the area where kids can do the mashup between two objects and there's a timer there so that they have one minute to figure out what kind of object they could create from, from the two disparate parts that have been discarded. Um, we're really trying to get kids to think of people to think about can you fix it instead of throwing it away and how could you transform it into something different? Uh, I just wanted to show you the side of the trash lab here because all of the images on the side um, were things that uh, were found in the Dane County landfill. And this is this is actually quite a sight when you see this driving down the highway and you realize that every single thing in here had a life and someone didn't value it. Um, so the whole idea that um, that waste isn't waste until you waste it is really kind of the, the um, overriding message of this exhibit and that we can all do a better job to not make so much waste. Um, so in the redesign section, we're also trying to get people to demand better product design from their favorite manufacturers and advocate for better systems from our local government. So finally, um, I just wanted to re-emphasize that how we design and build exhibits can change attitudes and behaviors. We have, we have lots of evidence of this through our evaluations over the years, that the way we design and the way we build does matter. People, people appreciate it and notice and then go on to take their own you know, actions. Um, design really does signal human intentions. If we want to have a better world, we can design and build to make that so. And really, children are the, should be the benchmark for all of our safety standards. And lastly, we're really, what we're really working for um, in green exhibit design is creating a closed loop system and a circular economy. So thank you so much. Um, I unfortunately am not going to be here for the question and answer, but my colleague Kia Carlin will be on um, for the, to answer any questions you have. And my email address is here if you want to be in touch with me later. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you to our speakers and um, to everyone attending. I do see we have some um, questions in the Q&A. So I do wanna, we'll, we'll stay on for a few minutes longer to try to address some of those. Um, but I did wanna take this opportunity to share some additional resources that we found helpful and particularly to give a call out to Key Culture, um, who was very helpful in terms of connecting us with people to speak to about this. Um, so if you're interested in pursuing this, certainly check out their Key Futures program. Um, I, it's a rolling admissions and a great opportunity to look at sustainability in your institution. So um, here is the contact information for all of our speakers. Um, feel free to reach out to them. I know um, Alice's uh, services are available for 
um, to help you as well with your path towards sustainability at your institution. Uh, Al is excited to talk about the Crates Project and the other research that we've done at IPI. And um, Brenda and Kia are um, both both have expressed interest in, in sharing their lessons learned and the great initiatives that they've been doing. So, um, and like I said, I'm happy to talk to you if you have uh, any additional resources that you'd like to share or if any of the topics addressed here you would like to see expanded upon in a future webinar, please reach out. So without further ado, let me pull up some of the, the questions here. Um, so um, let's start with um, Alice. Um, on your first slide, you mentioned determining which materials might have higher CO2 emissions. What's the process for determining that? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, of course, the process is not straightforward. That would be too easy. Um, by materials, I'm guessing I was referring to materials used by artists. I think that was at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and for this, it really depends on different aspects um, because a material can be harmful for various reasons. So uh, Brittany mentions the CO2 emissions that were created as a result of producing the material. Um, the other aspects could be the uh, toxicity of the product and the damage that it can have both on the environment and on the health of users. Um, it can also be the level of volatile organic compounds, and that also uh, largely vary depending on the product and the material itself. Um, it also depends on the packaging, if it's used uh, with single-use plastic, and whether uh, the material can be recycled or recyclable. And um, often, I, 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 to reply to that question, tend to um, recommend users to look at the back of materials. And sometimes when it's not written the full list um, of um, uh, what's in it, you can also Google it and find it online. So yeah, unfortunately, I'm afraid I don't have a straightforward answer for this, but by doing some research on each material, uh, we can get a sense of the CO2 emissions that are created for them. Thank you. And I know too, um, one of the resources listed to um, the American Institute for Conservation is pulling together a website too to kind of get a sense of life cycle assessments and information sheets on different materials. So hopefully we'll um, have some further resources in the, the future too for those material selections. Um, Al, uh, there was a question about um, the microclimates. One of the things you mentioned was the heat on the airport tarmac, which would otherwise not happen. Um, but considering that half of the, the globe in tropical climates is more common, could the technology be adapted to these climates where the ideal Northern Hemisphere Museum climate is often unrealistic? Yeah, so um, the, what I meant when the it may not have happened uh, is, is if if um, if a courier had been present and they they probably would have said no, you can't let that crate sit there <laughs> on the tarmac. So what we had was that it was in an enclosed space and so it's sitting in the sun and there was thermal gain. And so the one way that you can avoid it is um, is if there were a courier just to have them not not allow for that to happen. However, um, you could see that the that the thermal insulating material inside the crate. Um, very effectively buffered against that that temperature spike there, and so um, you know while while there was a huge like twenty six degree Celsius spike in in temperature on the outside of the crate, the inside of the crate where the objects are only raised by six degrees Celsius, and so um, that thermal that thermal layer actually really helped, and so. Um, if you are concerned about temperatures using some kind of thermal insulator really works. The thermal insulator that this particular institution uses, the same insulating uh, material that's used actually in walls and construction. Again, because it's polystyrene, it's terrible for the environment. Um, but we are looking into other thermal insulators that are um, that are actually much better for the environment from, from the way that they're produced to uh, you know what happens when they deteriorate or, or that they you know can go in the landfill and not be there forever. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. And um, Al, adding on to that, um, for those interested in the studies about the alt um, alternative materials for crates, how can people keep up with this information? Yeah, so you can um, 
subscribe to our newsletter, uh, which you can do through our website. Uh, all of our all of the results from from our study will definitely be written about in our newsletter. Um, you, you can email me, and I can put you on my my list of people that I contact uh, when when I have new information and and any reports that are coming out. If anyone's interested in being a field partner with us, we have we do have field partners. We're doing well with that, but I'm always happy to get more field data. So you can contact me um, about that as well. Shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and then uh, Alice, um, in the U.S., much of the shipping of artwork domestically is in medium or large size box trucks um, or larger semi tractor um, trailers. Do you have any information about CO2 emissions for these types of vehicles in comparison to domestic air or rail? Another great, great question. Unfortunately, no, I don't have um, an answer per se, because again, it would need to have more information about each specific mode of transport, um, which I don't have at the moment. So I'm unable to answer that question. However, what I will suggest is to, if the person doesn't have the information, yet to ask each transporter um, data information on how they uh, work and what's the information that they can share on that to then be able to compare both. Um, but unfortunately, as I explained in the presentation, it varies depending on so many aspects and variables, um, which only the transporter can, can provide. So uh, I'll, I'll probably suggest them to ask them directly. And sorry, I think I was trying to um, reply to an answer by uh, answering live, but he made it deleted. So I'm sorry yeah, about that. That's okay. I think the question was about if you could share the link that you mentioned. Yes, exactly, which I, I was trying to link, uh, but I did put it in the chat. So if it doesn't appear, let me know, but it's one of the first things I've shared. Okay, awesome. And Thank Alice, while we have you too, um, can you talk about how the CO2 calculations were made? What's the most efficient way to do calculations for each step? Yes, and I'm going to share right now um, three resources that I think will be useful to answer to that question. Um, so there, there's two tools that I'm familiar with um, that I've just put in the chat. There's one uh, from Julie's Bicycle in the UK and Gallery Climate Coalition. So they are carbon calculators, uh, very easy to use. They ask you a lot of questions, so you have to um, fill in with all the data that you can provide them, and then they uh, automatically give you an approximate uh, of the CO2 emissions. You can do that manually as well. That's what I've been doing before they um, existed. And um, other than that, at Key Culture, um, you mentioned the Key Futures program. That's something that we do also for the participants. So we help them to. Uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, calculate those CO2 emissions for each step. Great, thank you. Um, I think given the, the time, we'll um, conclude there. But as I said, if anyone has any further questions, um, please feel free to reach out to any of our speakers. Um, I want to thank all of you again for, um, for the excellent presentations. Uh, it's a great way to, to start off the day for those of us on um, in the United States. And um, for those of you who might be watching the recording later uh, as well, I hope that this um, is, is a good resource to, to start that ball rolling and thinking about um, what steps you might take at your own institution. So thank you again, Alice, Al, and Kia for being here um, and for Brenda virtually joining us. And um, all right, with that, I think we'll, we'll end today. Have a good day, everyone.